How many of you know what epistemology is? Raise your hands if, if you know what that word means, epistemology. I wouldn't expect you to, most of you perhaps. Anybody, raise your hands nice and high. Okay, there's like two hands going up. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. It's the study of what, everyone? Knowledge. knowledge. Epistemologists ask questions like this. They say, how do we know what we know? There are a great many things that we know, and an epistemological question is not just what do you know, but how do you know what you know? Now let me ask you a second question. How many of you believe that there is a God in heaven who is described in Scripture, who is a God of love, and who is looking out for your best interest? How many of you believe that? Raise your hands nice and high. How many of you believe that, that there's a God in heaven who is revealed in Scripture and is who, who is looking out for your best interest? Raise your hands nice and high. Okay, now hands down. Second question. How many of you know that? Do you hear the difference? The first question is, how many of you what? Believe it. And the second question is, how many of you know it? Is there a difference? Is there a difference between believing something and knowing something? These are the kinds of questions that epistemologists ask. They say, okay, you might believe that, but do you know it? What is the basis of knowledge? Now, let's see if we can unpack this. We're setting up our study today through 1 John. What book are we going to be looking at? 1 John. There are a great many things that you know that you could not prove to someone else's satisfaction if they insisted on disbelieving you. Okay? There are a great many things that you know for fact that you could not prove to someone else's satisfaction if they insisted on disbelieving you. Let me give an example. How many of you here today like chocolate chip cookies? Raise your hands. <laughs> Amelia, okay, hands right up. Woo. Some of you I can tell, right? I can tell you like those cookies. Right, you can't tell that I do, but I do. I like them. So now, let's think this through. Sanders, you, do you like chocolate chip cookies? Of course you do. You're a human. So what if I said to you, I don't believe you? Or to any of you, do you like chocolate chip cookies? What's your name? Jonathan. What if I said, Jonathan, I don't believe that you like chocolate chip cookies? Okay. He says he would have to prove it. Could you prove it? Okay, how would he go about proving it? Jonathan, how would you prove to me that you really do like chocolate chip cookies? Okay, he'd get a whole box of chocolate chip cookies with some milk, and he'd eat it right in front of me. And once you have finished that whole box and you're feeling sick to your stomach, do you know what I say? You don't. 70s, he may be in his 80s, and he's sitting down with an aged hand, and he's beginning to write a letter of tremendous concern to his churches. Just, just think of 1 John as the pastoral heart of John on full display. But as John writes, this isn't a nice, flowery, sweet little, you know, milk toast epistle. There is a huge and deep concern on John's heart. His church is being split, perhaps, right down the middle. There is a division, there is a kind of civil war taking place in his church, and for reasons not revealed in the epistle, John is not able to make the journey to Ephesus. He's not able to go, so he writes a letter as his kind of messenger, and you can just see it on every uh, page and every verse, on every chapter, just the heart, the pastoral concerned heart of John dripping with, with an aching, breaking heart over this situation. Now you say, what's the situation? Well, to set the context, we have to... First of all, let me ask you this question. Have you ever met somebody called an agnostic? Yes. Yeah, an agnostic. How many of us have heard that term before, an agnostic? What does that mean? When somebody says, oh, I'm an agnostic, what are they saying? They, okay, they don't believe. They're non-committal about belief, right? And so let me just see if I can find a piece of paper here, if I've got one. I don't. Can I borrow your Sabbath school quarterly there? This one? Okay. The word agnostic. You take the word, the letter A, which in the Greek and the Latin is the negation of a thing. Right? So for example, this Sabbath school quarterly is symmetrical. Right? Geometrically, it's symmetrical. What does that mean? It means that if we could fold this quarterly in half, we would have two sides that are identical. Right? That's symmetrical. Now, what if this Sabbath school quarterly was shaped like this? And you fold it in half and you do not have two equal sides. What do we call that? Asymmetrical, right? And so when you have an idea, you put the A in front of it, and that's the negation of that thing. So symmetrical, two sides equal, 
asymmetrical, two sides not equal. Listen to the term, agnostic. It comes from the word gnostic, gnosis, and the word means to know. It means what, everyone? To know, which is why I asked you right at the outset, how many of us know this word epistemology? It's the, it's the study of how we know what we know. The idea of a gnostic is that I do know. The idea of an agnostic is, guess what? I don't know. And that's, that's what an agnostic would say. An agnostic would say, well, there might be a God, there might not be a God, where an atheist would say positively there is no God, right? And a theist would say positively there is a God. An agnostic would say, hmm, I'm not so sure. And many of us today have to deal with agnostics. Well, in the first century and the second century, and moving into the third century, one of the main heresies that the apostles had to deal with was a heresy called Gnosticism. What's the heresy, everyone? Gnosticism. How many of us have heard that term before? Gnosticism. Most of, not most, may I could say many of the epistles in the New Testament were written with a backdrop resisting what was called Gnosticism. Now, you might be sitting there and saying, what is Gnosticism? What is second century and third century Gnosticism? Well, in, in a very simple context, the Gnostics claimed to know something, thus the term Gnostic, that everyone else didn't know. The Gnostics claimed to have inside information. They claimed to have inside data that others were not privy to. Let me give you a good illustration. How many of us either are into or we know somebody who is into conspiracy theories? You know these people? Right? Some of you are these people, right? And I have the privilege of traveling all over the world, and I'll go and I'll preach somewhere, and they say, Oh, Pastor, we really enjoyed that sermon. No, reach in. Pull out the DVD. They say, But have you seen this? As they scan the sky for black helicopters. And I say, No, no, no brother, what is it? Find out what really happened September 11th, 19. Right? I say, okay, I'll watch it. And you, you, have you ever seen any of these videos on YouTube or otherwise? It's very... What really happened? Who was really behind it? And it doesn't have to be September 11th. It could be a hundred things. It could be who really killed JFK. Did we really walk on the moon? Have you heard this one? Yeah. Woo, there's a big one out there. We didn't really go on the moon. It was just a conspiracy to get the United States ahead of the Russians in the space race. The whole conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy. But here's the point. When you meet someone who is committed to conspiracy theories, they have this idea that they're in the know. They're in the know, and the others, you know, we're working on them. They're the sheeple, right? Not the people, not the sheep. They're the sheeple. They don't know what we know, but now you have the DVD. And James, now we know. Okay? That's sort of the idea of, of first and second century Gnosticism that... I know something, and let me tell you something. BJ, if you knew what I knew, right, the whole of Babylonian teaching, much of paganism, and have you ever heard of Freemasonry? What? Freemasonry is based on this idea of the Gnostic, the no. Not everybody knows what we know, which is why in the dollar bill you have a classic Masonic symbol, which is the all-seeing eye. We know what others don't know. Wow. Now, in 1st and 2nd and 3rd century Gnosticism, the source of this secret knowledge had to do with God, and especially, in the Christian context, with Jesus. And the Gnostics basically said this. Rather than just denying Christianity outright, they sort of adopted Christianity. They'd come into a local congregation, and they would sort of, hey, hey, we're all brothers and sisters. But then, they would exist sort of on the fringes of the church, and they would begin to say things like, you know, God is spirit and cannot become flesh. So, so Jesus, you know, we, we, we love Jesus, but you need to understand the truth about Jesus. Let us tell you what we know, and then you'll be in the know. That's the term Gnostics. And most scholars don't believe that there was any one uniform group of Gnostics. Gnosticism was a, a term that was used for a variety of peoples that probably believed at least similar things, but not identical things. But these Gnostics would sort of hang out on the fringes, sometimes infiltrate churches outright, and say, listen, God is spirit, and as spirit, he cannot be become a, a flesh as we see. And so many of the Gnostics believed that Jesus was like an illusion. He was like a projection. He was like an apparition because God in his godness cannot become a man. That was one of the things. 
The other idea of the Gnostics, one of the several things that they believed, was that God could not possibly have a son. The idea of God having a son, this is simply very parabolic and analogous metaphoric language to communicate to the simple people. You know, the ones that don't know what we know. And so they denied the sonship of Jesus and that special relationship between God and the Father. And the third thing was this hideous, ludicrous idea they suggested that, that God would have to have a, a sacrifice to somehow placate or appease him. And so they denied the propitiatory death of Jesus. And so they basically would go on the fringes of these churches. They'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what the apostles have taught you, what the elders have taught you, that's all good, but, but we'll tell you what, what's really happening. You come happening, you come join with us, and you'll be in the know. Are we together, everyone? So look at 1 John chapter 1. Virtually all scholars believe that John is writing his book in a context, his epistle in a context of Gnosticism. And notice how he opens here, 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Now, some of you are sitting there thinking already. You're thinking, wait a minute, you're talking about epistemology, you're talking about Gnosticism. We are at Oakwood. It's 2010. I don't understand. You will understand. The reality is, is that many of us don't spend enough time really digging into Scripture to pull out the deeper meanings. We want it to be right on the surface. We want Scripture to be like USA Today. We want it to be like the National Enquirer. All you have to do is flip it open, there it is, and you move on. No, 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 no. Some of the greatest truths in Scripture require a little digging, require a little thinking. Are we together, everyone? A little thinking. Jesus did say, after all, didn't he, that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And what was that other one? With all your mind. In other words, thinking well is an act of worship to God. Thinking well is an act of worship to God. And many of us have almost lost the art of critical, evaluative, linear thinking. And so let's do a little thinking this afternoon. So Jesus opens up, for, or pardon me, John opens up, 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. He says, that which was from the what? That which was from the beginning. He begins his epistle very much the same way that he began his gospel. I wonder if there's any Bible student here that could quote for me John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How does the book of Genesis begin? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so John, purposefully in his gospel, uses this mosaic metaphor, uses this mosaic language, and says, in the beginning. Here in his epistle, he does the same thing. He says, in the, that which was from the beginning, which we have, what's the word? Heard. Which we have, what? Seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. If you were going to summarize the first three verses of 1 John, what's, what's he saying in a sentence? In, in just a simple sentence, how does he open this epistle to the church? Okay, somebody said it. Somebody said it there. Nice and loud. Come on, I know you can be loud. Okay, we know. What do we know? That Jesus... Well, okay, there we go. That Jesus was flesh, and he uses the language. How many times does he say, we saw him? We saw, four times. Not once. Not, four times he says, we saw him, we saw him, we saw him. And then he goes a step further. He said, we heard him. And then he even says, we what? We handled him. So John begins here with a very strong emphasis on the physicality of Christ. Jesus was a real man. John, it's as if John is saying, as he's riding there with age and hand to his church in Ephesus, he's saying, listen, I washed my clothes next to this guy in the river. I slept in the same camp as this guy. I watched him eat and I ate with him. I hugged this man. I saw him, I saw him, I saw him, I saw him, I heard him, and I even touched him. Are we together? So he's beginning to take issue with this idea that Jesus was a kind of apparition, a kind of ghost, a projection, not a real being, but an illusion. Now what's going to take place here is very interesting. This heresy that was no doubt uh, Gnostic-centered became so severe that look at what John says. Keep your finger right there in 1 John, and just keep your finger right there. Jump over to 2 John. Keep your finger right there. In 1 John, jump over to 2 John. It's the very next book, easy to find. 
Second John, there's just one chapter there, so you'll be able to find chapter one. And notice that this crisis reaches such a fever pitch. Notice some of the strangest and strongest counsel you will find anywhere in the New Testament. We're in 2 John chapter 1, and notice verse 7. He says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the what? What does your Bible say? As in the flesh. So these people say that Jesus has not really come in the flesh, and John calls them what? Deceivers. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now, there are many books in the Bible that speak about antichrist, but there's only one person that ever uses that term, and that's John. Paul never uses the term antichrist. None of the gospel writers use the term antichrist. As far as we know, Jesus never used the term. In fact, many scholars believe that John coined the term, that he's the one who came up with the term. Now, Daniel would speak about the antichrist, but he called him the, the little horn. Paul would speak about the Antichrist, but he called him the man of sin. And in the book of Revelation, John would also speak about the Antichrist, but he called him the beast, the beast that rose up out of the sea. But here he uses this term, Antichrist. Now, we tend to think of Antichrist as someone who's against, right? I'm against James. I resist James. But in the context in which John is speaking, an Antichrist is a usurper. An Antichrist seeks to take the place of, not to violently oppose, but to subtly impersonate. Are we together? And so he says, these people are deceivers and they're antichrists. What was it that they were denying? Because they deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. Now look at this, verse 8. Look to yourselves. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things that we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. He says, be attentive, pay attention. Do not be swept away with these sophistries. But look at this, some of the strangest and strongest counsel in the New Testament. Verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. If you don't believe what we taught you about the physicality and the sonship of the Messiah, you do not have God. Is that strong language? You do not have God. But look at what it goes on to say. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and what? And the Son. But look at verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Wow. Question, is John concerned? Yes. He's deeply concerned. John is over here, writing, we don't know precisely from where, but with, with, with withered hand and pastoral concern on his heart, he's writing and he sees his church being torn apart and he's using some of the strongest language you find anywhere in the New Testament. He says these people are deceivers, they don't have God, they are antichrist, and if you see them, don't invite them into your house. In fact, don't even greet them. He says if you do so, you are participants in their evil deeds. Is John stirred up? Very stirred up. And by the way, good pastors should be this way. A pastor, by the way, is a shepherd, right? His job is to protect the flock, right? We sometimes get the idea that the job of a pastor is just to be a nice guy. Where did we ever get the idea? I'll ask people all over the world. I'll say, so, you know, tell me about your pastor. Oh, well, he's a nice guy. Listen, I'm happy your pastor is a nice guy, but the first job requirement for a minister of the gospel is not just to be a nice guy, it's to be a man of the word, it's to be a man of prayer, it's to be a man of conviction, a man who is willing to defend, sometimes at, at all costs, his flock and his work. And so you see this here with John, he's concerned. Don't greet these people, don't let them into your home. Now why would John be so concerned? Because this deception must be subtly affected. He calls them deceivers. And the essence of deception is that you don't know you're being deceived. That's right. You see, if you knew you were being deceived, it wouldn't be deception. That's now you're sitting there thinking, I'm glad I'm not deceived. <laughs> the problem is, is that that's exactly how deceived people think. So John is concerned that some of these people will come in quietly, they'll come in cleverly, they'll come in subtly, and they'll begin to draw away disciples by being friendly. Hey man, how you doing? How you doing, Mike? Good to see you, bro. Hey, we need to... And he says, no, 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 no. This is so serious, this is so, this is so somber. Don't greet these people. And don't have them in your home because you are participating in helping them to tear this church apart and to infiltrate with this negative gospel. Is John concerned? Okay. 
Now with that in mind, go back to 1 John. Go back to 1 John and let's sort of get our fingers here on the nature of this heresy and more importantly, John's solution. Some of you are thinking, okay, I'm following it, Pastor, I'm with you, but, but where, where does it scratch me here, Huntsville, Alabama, 2010? I, I hear the teaching, I hear the context, but at some point, it's got to... At some point, it's got to scratch where I'm itching. You hang in there. It is going to scratch exactly where many of you, I would suggest all of you at some level, are itching. Are we together, everyone? So look at what happens here. John, we're back to 1 John. Go to chapter 2 now. And notice what he says. Let's set a little bit more of a context here concerning these deceivers. We'll pick it up in verse 18. 1 John chapter 2. What verse are we in? 18. What are the first two words of that chapter? Or that, that, that verse? Little children. This is one of the reasons that we believe that John was an older man at this point, an older pastor. He refers repeatedly to his congregation as little children. My little children. Look at what he says. Little children. It is the last hour. And as you have heard that the, what's coming? The Antichrist is coming, probably getting this directly from uh, the, the writings of Paul, 2 Thessalonians and others. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Now look at verse 19. This is where the plot thickens significantly. They went out from us. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That means they used to be church members. These people were in the church. They were part of the church. Look at what he says. They went out from us, but then he clarifies, but they were not what? Of us. I got to say something here. I got to say something here because it's biblical. Not everyone in the church, not everyone in the church is a Christian. Where did we ever get the idea that being in a building made you a follower of Jesus? Right? We might be in a church on the right day, saying the right things, wearing the right clothes, and singing the right songs. This does not a Christian make. John says, they went out from us, but they were never of us. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Look at what he says now, verse 20. We're going to come back to this. But you have an... You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. We're going to come back to that because that is rich. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Now look at verse 22 and 23. This really gives us an insight to the nature of this heresy and these deceivers who are trying to split apart the church. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the what? Ah. Denying the messianic identity of Jesus, the physicality of Jesus. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies what? The Father and the Son. So these people were denying that there was a special relationship, a father-son paternal relationship between the Father and the Son. Verse 23, whoever denies the Son does not acknowledge the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. We begin to get an insight here into exactly what was being promoted by these deceivers and by these people that were trying to break apart the church. Basically, they were denying the physicality of Christ. He was an apparition. He was an illusion. He was a kind of ghost. They also denied the sonship of Christ. Oh, Jesus, you know, God as a father. One of the central tenets of, of Gnosticism was that God couldn't have a son. The idea that God has a son is absurd. And so they denied the sonship of Christ, they denied the physicality of Christ, and they also denied the necessity of Jesus' death. And so they began to woo people away with their secret knowledge. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, what John taught you? Oh, we so appreciate you. Remember, they're deceivers. They're not just going to come right out and say, hey, I'm here to ruin your church and ruin you. Oh, no, 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 no. We so appreciate John. I, I know. I, I, was in, I was one of the founding members of this church. But I've learned some things. Some things that a smart person like you, flattery. Some things that a smart person like you might be able to understand. I'd like to share them with you sometime. Maybe you should come fellowship with us and we'll teach you some of the things that we know. Some of the things that we what? No. Now go back to 1 John chapter 1. I use the word fellowship there. Fellowship. Fellowship. 
Right as John writes his epistle, we've already read this, we have seen, we have seen, we have seen, we have seen, we have heard, and we have felt. But notice the very, very next thing that he says. Very interesting. We'll pick it up there in verse uh, 3. Uh, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may also have, what's the word? Fellowship with us and truly our what? Fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from Him and declared to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have, what's the word? Fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have, what's the word? Fellowship with one another and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. What's the word that He uses here? One, two, three, four times in the first, in the opening verses of His epistle. What is He saying? Fellowship. Koinonia. He's basically saying, we have fellowship with Christ, and by virtue of fellowship with Christ, we have fellowship with the Father. And if you have fellowship with us, then you have fellowship with Christ and fellowship with the Father. And this is the fellowship that matters. Most believe, and I am inclined to agree, that John, right at the outset, is drawing a line in the sand. He is, he is basically saying, don't go to another fellowship because we have the truth about Christ and His Sonship and His relationship to the Father. Are we together? Fellowship, And so you begin to put this together and a picture emerges. A picture emerges in which people are saying, Oh, James, man, so good. I haven't seen you in a while. Let me tell you, man, I've learned some things. I've had some people over here. I know I used to go to the... And don't get me wrong, I love what John is teaching us. I love what John taught us. And man, you know, I, I, I love it. But there's some things you need to know. Let me, te let me tell you some of the things that we know. And this is why they were called the Gnostics. It was secret knowledge. And you can know what we know, and the whole basis of salvation, the whole basis of being in right relationship with God, is knowing. The rest of the people don't know what we know, and so we, hey, hey, come be with us. And John is writing from afar, and he sees this begin to tear his church in two to such a degree that he writes and he says, if you see these people, even though they formerly may have been members of our church, don't greet them, don't have them in your home. If you do so, you are actually facilitating and catalyzing the very work they're trying to do in our church. Are we together? Are we getting a context here? Now, now let's sort of pan out here a bit and ask a question. How is John going to counteract what's taking place in his church? Well, let me tell you what I would have tried to do. What I would have tried to do. And probably what you may have tried to do as well. I just need a... Can I borrow you real quick? Demars, is that right? James. Okay, James. Got, James, can I borrow you too? I'll just borrow you real quick. Okay, come on up here, buddy. And if you could stand there. Okay, this is James. This is James. Everybody say, hi, Jameses. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. James, we're going to make... Do you want to be the good guy or the bad guy? Good guy. Okay. That makes you the bad guy, James. So James is going to be John. You're John that's writing the epistles. Okay? And you are... You're the, you're the deceivers. Okay? You're the Gnostics. Okay, now watch what happens. On this side, the Gnostic deceivers are telling the church... We know something that the others don't. We know. And so they're trying to woo people into their fellowship. Are we together? And if you join us, you can know what we know. And let me tell you, this knowledge is so liberating. This knowledge is so thrilling. I tell you, when I learned this, what John got us started with, that was good stuff, but that was the milk. This is the meat. Right? And some of you have even fallen into some of this with, with independent ministries. You think, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What Pastor Newborn, what Pastor Ashwick is preaching, that's good stuff. But let me give you the real deal. Let me give you the good stuff, right? And you think the good stuff is 50,000 Ellen White quotations strung together in the strongest possible language. And you think, oh, this is the straight testimony. Beloved, beloved, listen to me. Just because it's strong doesn't mean it's good for you. Liquor is strong, but it's not good for you. Are we together, everyone? So you think, oh, if it's the strong stuff, it's the straight testimony. No, no, no. The straight testimony is the righteousness of Christ. Are we together? So some of you have even fallen into this. You've fallen into this. Beloved, listen to me. This is, this is the deceiver in, an, in, the, in the historical context. He's saying, hey, come with us. Come with us. We know what John has taught you was a good start, but we'll take you to the next level. What you learned at Oakwood University Church, that was a good start. But we'll take you to the next level. You join our independent ministry, you come to the Shepherd's Rod, whatever it is, we'll take you to the next level. Are we together? And so, 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 th and, and they use the same language. They talk about Jesus. 
In a modern context, they'll use Spirit of Prophecy, they'll use Ellen White, 9T, 3SM, 1SM, Maranatha, Conflict of the Ages. So they're speaking your language, and they're sincere, and they're sweet, and they're deceivers. Are we together? And so that's you. I'm sorry, James. So he's wooing you away. Now, John is over here. He's not with his church. For some reason, he's apart, which is why he had to write a letter. If, if he was on site in Ephesus, we would, probably wouldn't even have First John, because what's the need to write a letter if you're on site? So John is going to write a letter, but watch what happens here. If John says, no, 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 those deceivers are wrong, what I'm telling you is true, right? What I'm telling you is true. And then what's he going to say? What's he going to say? What would be his response? No, what? I'm telling you is true. And what I'm telling you is da 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 oh, What's John going to say? No, 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 no. What he's telling you is false. What I'm telling you is true. Now, what is this going to do to the church, especially if the deceivers used to be members of our church, maybe an elder or a deacon that we love, right? What's this going to do to our church when he says... No, 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 what I'm telling you is true, and he's sincere, and we love him. And John is saying, no, 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 what I'm telling you is true. And to further complicate matters, John is, is away, and he's doing this all by letter, by proxy. What's, what's going to happen to the church? Confusion. Absolute confusion. People are going to be divided. They're going to, some loyalties are going to be here. Some loyalties are going to be here. And so John, in a stroke of absolute spirit-inspired pastoral brilliance, does not get into a shouting match with either the church or the deceivers. Because he doesn't want it to be, no, my dad can beat up your dad. Uh-uh, my dad can beat up your dad. My dad's tougher than your dad. All right, I'll see you at the playground. No, 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 he's not going to get involved. With that. <laughs> Are we together on this is what would happen if John just... If John just resisted every point that the deceivers were saying, this would just be a shouting match, and then we would just have to choose our allegiance. All right, man. You baptized me, I'm going to stay with you. No, 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 no. And other people saying, I never liked that pastor anyway. He's always on vacation. I'm staying with you. Right? Rather than having people have their loyalties this way, watch what John does. Okay, thanks so much, guys. You see the point here. Watch what John does. Watch what he does. This is awesome. And now we're getting right down to where you're scratching. Look at what he does. 1 John chapter 2. It's a verse we just read, and I said we'd come back to it, and now we're back to it. 1 John chapter 2. What verse, everyone? Verse 20. Verse 20. He says, But you have, what do you have? You have an anointing. Now that's a word we use a lot. But we better start using it in a biblical context. What does John mean by the anointing? Let's watch. But you have an anointing from who? From the Holy One. And watch this. And you, what's the word? You know how many things? All things. Now, let's just pause here. Is John saying, you know everything about everything? How could he be saying that? Right? If you added up every bit of knowledge that you have, every single book you've read, every teacher you learned from, every magazine article, every hour you spent studying, if you added up the sum total of your knowledge, it would be less than a tenth of a percent of the total knowledge there is on, on planet Earth. In other words, in other words, you don't know anything. Wow. Incidentally, neither do I. And incidentally, neither really does anybody else. Which is why it's so critical that we have a word from someone who does know. So John writes and he says, you know everything. But he's not saying, you know geography, you know calculus, you know topology, you know epistemology. No, 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 no. He's saying, you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things relative to your sonship and your salvation in Christ. Let's continue. Look at what he goes on to say. This is absolutely amazing. That's verse 20. Look at verse 21. He says, I have not written to you, and this is the stroke of pastoral brilliance. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth. Are you seeing what he's doing here? I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because what? Be be because you know it and know lies of the truth. So let's go back to our illustration here. The deceivers are there and John is here rather than... The deceiver is saying, no, what I'm saying is true. 
And John's saying, no, 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 no. What I'm saying is true. And this guy's saying, no, 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 no. John's well-meaning, but he's old and he's losing his mind. What I'm telling you is true. And these people are saying, no, 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 no. What I'm telling you is, no, look at, look at what John does. Brilliant. Rather than getting into an arguing match and saying, I know, no, I know, I know, no, I know. The, the undergirding here, the undergirding uh, uh, essence of this argument is that you don't know. So you need me to come and teach you. That's what you need me. You don't know. Right? You're just a bunch of ignorant people. And fortunately, you've got me as super pastor. Right? And that's basically what these people are saying. That's why they were called Gnostics. We're the ones who know, and by implication and extension, you don't know. So look at what John does. John says, hey, I'm writing to you. I'm writing to you. Not because you don't know what's true, but because you do know. In fact, you know everything. In context, everything you need to know. Look at what he goes on to say, verse 22. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. That, that, what I, that which I preached to you when I first showed up in Ephesus many, perhaps, decades ago. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Verse 27. But the anointing. There it is again. But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. Here it comes again. And you do not need that anyone, what? You don't need that anyone teaches you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him. Look at what he's saying. He is saying, you don't need anyone to teach you. Now, by extension and by implication, who would that include? That would include John. Do you see what he's doing? Rather than getting into a shouting match, no, I know what's right. 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 He says, you know what's right. And you know what's right, not because a man taught you. In fact, you don't need a man to teach you this. The anointing taught you this. The anointing taught you this. Now, what is this anointing? What is this anointing that teaches us something that we don't need a man to teach us? Let's see in context, what is this anointing? We talk about, oh, an anointing. What is this anointing? Right in context. That's what we're doing right here. Right? You theologians are loving it. We're in the text. We're going to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 24. Chapter 3, what verse are we in? 24. Now he who keeps his, what? Commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we, what is the word, everyone? By this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given. Now, for those of you that are attentive Bible students, let me just let the cat halfway out of the bag. For those of you that are attentive Bible students, you have already picked up on the fact that John, in this epistle, has a favorite word. Has anybody picked up on that word? He uses it over and over again. You, who said it? You nailed it. You're paying attention. Front row, a student, right? No. What's the word, everyone? The word is no. You know all things. What are the Gnostics saying? What are they saying? Not only do you not know all things, you don't know anything. But, wait for it, we'll teach you. We'll teach you because you don't know anything. But John's counter-argument is not, hey, but I know better. I was the disciple of Jesus. No, 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 no. He says, you know. Because the anointing, the anointing, and here, the Spirit abides in you. The Spirit abides in you. Something very interesting is that John, in 1 John, the little book of 1 John, five chapters... How many chapters, everyone? Five chapters. Now, I could be a little off on this, but I'm close. I, I didn't do the research right before I stepped up, but I'm close on this. First John uses the word no more than any other book in the New Testament, I'm virtually certain. And, and by, by size, it's, there's not even a comparison. 
because it's just five chapters. You compare that with 28 in Matthew, 24 in Luke, 21 in John, and uh, 16 in Mark. No, nothing is even close. He says, no, we know, we know. In fact, let me just give you an example. Go to chapter 5. Look at how he closes. Look at how he closes his epistle. 1 John chapter 5. What chapter are we in, everyone? Chapter 5. Check it out. Verse 11. And this is the testimony that God has given us. What has he given us? Eternal life. And where is this life found? In his Son. He who has the Son, say it with me, has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you may hope. Not that you may want. Not that you may conjecture. Not that you may long. No, 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 no. That you may, what's the word? that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Jump down to verse 15. And if we, what's the word? Know that He hears us, whatever we ask. What's the next one? We know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. Jump down to verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Jump down to verse 19. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may... Know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Done. <laughs> what is he saying over and over and over and over again as he closes his epistle? What's he saying? What's he saying? We know. 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 Why does he use this word over and over again? Simple. He is counteracting the influence of these people who are saying, what are the Gnostics saying? What does the word Gnostic mean? What are they saying? We know. And John says, I didn't write this to you because you're stupid. I didn't write this to, to you because you're ignorant and, and you need some teacher to come in as super pastor and tell you. He says, I didn't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know the truth. Are we together, everyone? So he uses the word over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. We know, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know. Now, when we began this thing, I asked you, how do you know what you know? How do you know? Is there a difference between knowing and believing? Is there a difference? Do you believe that two plus two is four? Or do you know it? You know it. You see the difference? Do you believe, James, do you believe that you are a man? <laughs> Give me some love. He knows it. He knows it. And he's not going to prove it. He knows it. Right? Are we together? See, there are things that we know. There are things that we know that we may not be able to show to other people's satisfaction, but we know it. Look at what John says here. We know we know. We know. And he gets to such a degree that he says, you know because of the anointing. You know because of the anointing. And then we say, well, what is this anointing? And he tells us right there in chapter 3, the anointing is the Holy Spirit. The anointing is the what, everyone? Holy Spirit. So we're going to stay right in 1 John. Look at chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible says, by this we, what's the word? There it is. Not we hope, not we conjecture, not we imagine. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us. How do we know? According to this verse, how do we know? Because He has given us of His Spirit. So if John were here today and we were to say, John, how do I know I'm in Christ? How do I know that I abide in Him? And how do I know that He abides in me? What would John say based on this text? By the Spirit. You would know by the Spirit. Stay right there in 1 John. Notice chapter 5, verse 6. This is He, speaking of Jesus, who came by water and blood. Incidentally, this is probably a reference to His birth. Because when a, a child is born, if you've ever seen it, it's a messy affair, and there's blood. But what happens just before a woman gives birth? Her what breaks? Her water breaks. And so this is almost certainly a reference, at least in part, to the physicality and the reality of Jesus' birth, his actual birth as a real infant, which was one of the things the Gnostics were denying. He says, this is he who came by water and blood. He was really born. 
This is he who came by water and by blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and by blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness. Who's bearing witness, everyone? The Spirit, because the Spirit is truth. Jump down to verse 8. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now look at verse 9. Fascinating. If we receive the witness of who? Of men, the witness of God is greater. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness where, according to John. Now, if you're in the habit of underlining in your Bibles, that should be totally underlined, marked, star, check, squiggly line, smiley face, right there. Verse 10, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness. Where does he have the witness? In himself. Now, look at this. He who does not believe has made John a liar. He who does not believe has made David Asherick a liar. What does the text say? He who does not believe has made who a liar? has made God a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did God give this testimony that's being denied? How did he give this testimony? By his Spirit. He gives this testimony by his Spirit. And he says there, we accept the testimony of men. This is easily illustrated. Easily illustrated. Are there any people here who are vegetarians? Some of you are like afraid to admit it. Like, let me see who's here. Place that you know good and well, I have revealed myself to you. God says, that's foolish. That's foolish. John was in a situation. The Gnostics were saying, you don't know. We know. That's why they were called the Gnostics. Hey, we know. We know what's really up with Jesus. We know what's really up with the sacrifice. We know. We have inside information. Conspiracy theory type stuff. And if you come join our fellowship, then you will also know. What's John's counter argument? John's counter argument over here is, ah, 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 not so fast. Beloved, I'm not writing this epistle to you because you don't know. I'm writing this epistle to you because you do know. In fact, you know everything. Everything that is needful for your salvation, everything that is needful for your acceptance in Christ and your sonship or your daughtership, you already know it. You don't need anyone to teach you because the anointing, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. He says it over and over again. The Spirit has taught you this. And if we accept the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. So here's my question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? You better do more than believe. You better know. Do you hear the difference? See, if I believe it, it's up for, it's up for discussion. But if I know it... Now, here's where the skeptic comes. The skeptic comes and says, the skeptic comes and says, prove it to me. Prove it to me. I'll let you in on a little secret here. You can't. You can't. Any more than I can prove to you that I like chocolate chip cookies. I can't prove to you that I know in my heart of hearts that God through his own self-revelation by his spirit has shown me that I am his son. And that I was made in his image and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I can't prove that to you. But I still know it. Are we together? Because there's a difference between what we know and what we are able to show. Now, by my life, I'll try and show it to you. But if somebody insists on remaining skeptical, you can't prove God to somebody else's satisfaction. But check this out. You can prove God to your own satisfaction by the person of his spirit which is so brilliant, by the way, because that means everybody has to make their own decision. Now, check this out. For those of you that have skeptical friends or skeptically, skeptical family members, or let's be honest, every one of us in some way has a skeptical bone in us at times. Is that true? Okay, check this out. The word skeptic, skeptic, comes from the Greek word skeptine. 
skeptine. Do you know what it means? It means to view from a distance. That's what the word means. It means to view from a distance. You see, a skeptical person is somebody who's non-committal about maybe an idea or a philosophy or a political system or, or, or some uh, worldview. A skeptic can just sort of be over here. I'm over here with Bryant, and we're like the two men on the Muppets. Remember those two guys on the Muppets? <laughs> when the Muppets were always doing their thing, like, who are these clowns running this program? <laughs> this is us. We're over here, right? And so we're not committed. We're, we're just observing what's going on. What do you think what's going on over there? Oh, that's not my thing. I ain't, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. So, so we're skeptical. Skeptical means to view from a distance. It means to be non-committal. Are we together? Now check this out. You can be skeptical about an idea. You can be skeptical about a philosophy. You can be skeptical about an ideology. You can be skeptical about a concept. But at some point, if you want to get to know a person, I can't get to know a person from over here. Hey, James. How you doing, man? You doing good? Where are you from? Yeah? Can't hear me. Sander, where are you from, man? What's up with you guys? Where's my people? Right? I can't get to know somebody from over here. Can you get to know a person from a distance? How do you get to know people? How do you get to know people? You got to get close to them. Beloved, listen, you can be skeptical about a concept. You can be skeptical about a philosophy. You can be skeptical about an idea. But God is not a concept. God is not an idea. God is not a philosophy. God is a person. And if you want to know God, you've got to at least provisionally Surrender your skepticism. And you're going to have to come up and say, I'm David. See, if I'm going to get to know Brother Mike, it's going to be here. I've got to come close in order to get to know a person. Are we together? You see, some of you are skeptical in your ideas, even in your thoughts. You have doubts. You just surrender provisionally that skepticism, and then the Bible says you come to know Jesus. Listen to the language. Taste and see that the Lord is good. What is this? What is taste? What is taste? It's an experience. God invites you, not to prove Him, to experience Him. Wow. John was writing to people who were struggling with what do we know and what do we believe. And John said to them, you know. You're a daughter of God and you know it. You're a son of God and you know it. And not because I told you so, but because the Spirit told you so. One day Jesus was with his disciples in the temple. And he was saying things like, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And the people were like, oh. The disciples were like, why does he always have to talk like this? <laughs> Half of the time the disciples were totally... Beside, they were just befuddled with what Jesus was saying. Like, oh, okay. And then, but Jesus, when he sensed that people were offended, he intensified what he said in John 6 in the temple. He said, hey, listen to me. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. Your fathers ate manna and died in the wilderness. And then the Bible says when, when many of his disciples heard that, John 6, 6, 6, by the way, John chapter 6, verse 66, John 6, 6, 6, Many of his disciples walked with him no more. Wow. They said, you know, when we joined the Messiah Club, we were like sharpening our swords. We couldn't wait to lop the heads off the Romans. But, ah, this whole drinking blood. <laughs> right? And so Jesus is looking, and some of the disciples are going away. Right? And so Jesus, in a moment of pensivity, in a moment of poignancy, Jesus, in a moment of, of just rawness, as, the, as many of his disciples are going away, He turns to the twelve, and he says, um, are you going to go away too? Listen to Peter. Now, sometimes Peter blew it, <laughs> didn't he? I mean, sometimes you're like, Peter, come on, man. But other times he hit it out of the park, right? 
And this is one of those answers. This is up there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Like, this is a top five answer in Scripture. Okay? Jesus says, will you go away with them? And Peter says, Lord, to whom would we go? Listen, listen. You have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I know you're here. You're here on Sabbath afternoon. I know that you believe. Let me invite you to know. Ask for the inner witness of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans says that the Spirit Himself, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. In fact, that Spirit comes inside of you, and do you know what that Spirit says when it gets up inside of you? It says, Abba, Father. You see, the Spirit comes inside and says, Clifford, you're a son of God. You are a son of God made in my image. I love you and I died for you. You are my child. And you sense it. Someone says, is it an emotion? It's not an emotion. Someone says, is it a feeling? It's not a feeling. Someone says, is it an audible voice? It's not an audible voice. It's the self-disclosure, the self-revelation of God by His Spirit to hearts that are open to hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Where are you going to go? Don't get me wrong. I know that there's some hypocrites in church. People say to me, Pastor, there's so many hypocrites in the church. I say, well, you know what? If you came, there'd just be one more. Right? So, so you come with us, and we'll all be hypocrites together. Because no one's going to stand up right now and tell me you don't have any hypocrisy in your life. Where are you? I'm ready. I'll let you stone me right now. Every one of us is wrestling with issues of authenticity and transparency. Every one of us is trying to know Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? Okay, so you're in church, and you love the Lord, and I love the Lord, and I know there's issues, and I know it's hard, and I know people will do you wrong. But let me tell you something. The voice of God speaks to you and says, You're my daughter. The Spirit speaks right to some part of you. It's indescribable. It's incommunicable. It's inscrutable. And the Spirit says to you, I made you. I love you. I created you for myself. Beloved, this transcends belief. We have moved beyond belief. John says, I have written these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Where are you going to go? It's going to get hard, but where are you going to go? Peter says, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ. I want to ask you a question as we close. Have you followed this? Have you followed this presentation? Does it make sense? You invite the Spirit into your heart. You pray for that anointing. The choir is, ah! It's not gonna ha- it doesn't have to be like that. It's just an awareness. I'm God's son. I'm God's daughter. He loves me. And I love him. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. You've heard me today, the testimony of a man. I invite you to hear the testimony of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we believe.